Right, so I think we'll just get started then, everyone. Um, so thank you for joining today's uh, webinar. The agenda is on the on the slide here. So we're going to start by doing a bit of a case update, which I'll do, and then the kind of main focus of today's webinar will be um, Jen Skioch, a partner on the team, and Alaria Moretti, a senior solicitor on the team, and they'll be looking at some top tips on conducting workplace investigations. Um, we're hoping that Jen will be able to join us. She is having some IT issues, um, so hopefully she'll join shortly. Um, if not, I'm sure Alaria will be able to um, cover cover that topic. Um, so you're, you're, in, you're in safe hands either way. Um, just the usual reminder to make sure that you're on mute uh, throughout the session. That will just limit any background noise. And also just a reminder that we'll be recording today's session as well. So we'll follow up with a, a recording of the session. If you've got any questions as we go, um, just given I think the numbers on, on the call today, it would be great if you could just pop those questions in the chat and then, then we'll pick those up. We'll pick those up at the end. Um, so if we just move on then, and um, I'll start just by covering uh, a case law update. So um, we've got three cases to look at today. Um, Katrina, I don't know if you can move on to the next slide. Perfect, thank you very much. So um, the first case is the case of Webb against London Underground. Um, and in this case, the employment tribunal had to determine whether the employer had infringed the employee's right to private life and right to freedom of speech by dismissing her for reasons related to Facebook posts on her private Facebook page. So in this case, the claimant had worked for the respondent for 32 years, so a very long serving employee. She was a white manager with responsibility for a large team of ethnically, ethnically diverse staff. And she posted some comments on her private Facebook page relating to the death of George Floyd and, and the aftermath of that. Colleagues who were Facebook friends complained to the respondent and after a disciplinary process, she was dismissed for gross misconduct. And she raised, raised claims of unfair dismissal and race discrimination amongst others. The tribunal found that the comments made by the claimant were offensive, inflammatory and racially divisive. Further, it noted that the respondent's policies were clear that use of social media, including private accounts, could give rise to issues of gross misconduct where the posts were offensive or where they might damage the respondent's reputation. And the policies also cautioned that social media posts made privately can become more widely distributed and find themselves in the public domain. And so importantly here, the claimant was essentially warned that such matters would be viewed seriously and may be considered grounds for dismissal. The tribunal held that the dismissal was not discriminatory as the dismissal was due to the claimant's misconduct. Uh, being the making of social media posts contrary to the respondent's policies, uh, albeit there were procedural issues with the dismissal, uh, dismissal which rendered it unfair, which I'll come on to in a second. But I think of particular interest in this case was the, the line of argument that the claimant took concerning infringement of her right to private life and right to freedom of expression under the European Convention on Human Rights quite a techie argument and one um, which the employer here basically ignored during the disciplinary process, which, which then created difficulties for the employer during the tribunal process. Um, the question for the tribunal in relation to this point was whether it was reasonable for the respondent to rely upon the content of the posts made on the claimant's private account for uh, disciplinary purposes, having regard to the claimant's right to private life. And in considering this point, the tribunal noted that the respondent's policies warned the claimant of the risk of circulation of private Facebook posts to the public and of potential disciplinary action if such posts were inconsistent with the employer's social media policy. Um, and in addition to this, the claimant had also posted comments on the accounts of people who were out with her Facebook friends. And in the tribunal's view, it was likely, therefore, that the claimant would have expected and welcomed her posts uh, being broadcast beyond her, her friends 
And so the tribunal held that the right to private life was not engaged here because the claimant could have no reasonable expectation that the posts were only part of her private life. In respect of the claimant's right to freedom of expression, the tribunal held that by dismissing the claimant for the posts, there has been the respondent was interfering with this right. However, interference can be justified under the convention on certain grounds, including the protection of the reputation of the respondent and protection of the rights of other employees. So for example, not to be offended or upset by the claimant's posts. And the tribunal held that both grounds applied in this case. The evidence showed that other members of staff were deeply offended by her posts and comments. And they also found that there was a genuine and sufficient reputational issue for the respondent as it was a public body with a high profile operating in a community which is ethnically diverse and the debate into which the claimant had become embroiled was subject to the highest possible scrutiny particularly at the time. The respondent was under, was under an obligation to act to avoid damage to its reputation among staff and the community and its response therefore was a justifiable restriction on the claimant's right to freedom of expression. Um, so whilst this is only a first instance decision, so it's not binding on other tribunals. It does provide a couple of helpful reminders for employers. So firstly, ensure that social media policies warn that social media posts made privately may find themselves in the public domain and that use of social media could give rise to issues of gross misconduct where the posts are offensive or where there might be damage to the respondent's reputation. Um, the employer having those um, policies in place certainly helped in this case. Also, the tribunal held that the dismissal was flawed for procedural reasons. And, and one of those procedural issues was that the respondent did not properly consider the claimant's argument of the right to free speech at the appeal hearing. So the claimant raised this during the, the appeal stage of the disciplinary process, but basically the the respondent failed to engage with it. They, they essentially ignored it. And, and because they did that, it led to um, the dismissal being unfair. And so the takeaway here really is that if an employee raises arguments concerning contravention of convention rights during a disciplinary process, then you really should seek legal advice to ensure that these are properly considered and responded to at the time. Moving on then to the next case, which is FAMI against Arts Council England. This is a case in which the tribunal considered whether an employee with gender critical beliefs had been harassed under the Equality Act 2010. I think this is certainly becoming, if it's not already, a bit of a hot topic for the HR world and a topic which can be particularly tricky to deal with in practice. In this case, the claimant had been employed since 2008 and held the view that sex is real, important, immutable and not to be conflated with gender identity, which is often referred to as, as gender critical beliefs. There was no dispute here that her belief was protected under the Equality Act um, because of earlier case law. So some of you may have um, maybe aware of the Forstater case, which held um, that gender critical beliefs can be protected. So there was no dispute, no dispute about that in this case. Um, the question really was whether she had been harassed related to those beliefs. Um, and this case really all came about because of a grant um, which was awarded to a charity, the LGB Alliance. Um, and the grant was um, awarded to make a film. There then followed allegations that the charity um, who had been in receipt of the grant to make the film, that the charity was transphobic and the funding was then suspended. Senior management of the respondent then held a drop-in session during which the funding withdrawal was discussed. During the discussion, a senior manager expressed personal views that LGB Alliance was divisive and that the award of the grant had been a mistake. The claimant challenged the view that the charity was anti-trans and asked how gender critical views were protected at the Arts Council and in the arts. Comments by other staff members expressing competing views to that of the claimant were made during the meeting as well. Following the session, the same senior manager then emailed all staff confirming that it was important to treat staff with respect and dignity. Um, and he expressed his personal solidarity with trans and non-binary colleagues 
Another employee then sent an email to all staff, which confirmed that the LGBT plus working group was raising a formal grievance in response to how the LGB Alliance funding decision was handled in the drop-in session and the conflict of interest of senior managers um, of staff um, with clear homophobic anti-trans views and positions of decision-making, which the claimant thought referred to her. And this um, also included a link to an ally support sheet, which would be submitted along with the grievance. And, and this sheet was actually open to all staff to view and add comments to, and the tribunal noted that some extremely offensive comments from numerous employees of the respondent had been added, including referring to gender critical beliefs as bigotry and cancer, and one which stated it's clear that there are members of our own organisation who are happy to be vocally anti-trans and gender critical. We shouldn't have to put up with this any more than maybe racist or sexist behaviour. And the petition was then moved following complaints from the claimant's line manager and another member of management. Um, so you can imagine being in the HR team at this point when it was all kicking off. Um, and then on the 13th of May, the claimant submits a complaint under the respondent's dignity at work policy regarding this drop-in meeting and then the all staff email which followed. And following investigation of the complaint, disciplinary proceedings were taken against employees involved in the all staff email. Ultimately, the claimant raised tribunal claims, including one for, for harassment related to religion and belief in respect of the, the drop-in meeting and the all staff email. As most of you will know, under the Equality Act, harassment is unwanted conduct, which has um, the purpose and effect or effect and or effect, sorry, of violating the claimant's dignity and creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. And the unwanted conduct needs to be related to a relevant protected characteristic. Here it was religion and belief. So the tribunal looked at all of this and found that it was um, inappropriate for the senior manager to provide his personal views and express solidarity with one side of the debate during the drop-in session and his subsequent email, but found that this did not cross the line of amount amounting to harassment. However, the all staff email and the associated comments did amount to harassment. They caused deep upset for the claimant and had the purpose of creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment for her. There's obviously a defence available to an employer if it can show that it took all reasonable steps to prevent an employee from harassing a colleague. And on that point, the tribunal held that the respondent failed to take such, such steps as their relevant policy was not up to date. Uh, basically, it had um, omitted reference to belief discrimination, amongst other issues. And, and despite the fact that the claimant had raised the issue of the need for training in respect of the different positions held on trans activist and gender critical beliefs previously, the respondent had not provided any such training. I think they had looked into providers of um, such training, but they hadn't found anyone suitable. Again, this is a first instance decision, which is not binding on other tribunals, but it illustrates the importance of creating and fostering an environment where all protected beliefs are recognised, which can be difficult for employers to achieve. Um, some things which employers can do, though, is having an up-to-date policy, which references the correct terms and also providing training for all staff, as well as manager-specific training. Um, our team has actually pulled together some training in this area. It's called Trans Legal Awareness Training for Employers, which covers competing beliefs, how to handle similar matters and more. So please do get in touch with us if you'd like more information about this training or indeed any other training. Moving on then to the third and final case, which is a holiday pay case, everyone's favourite topic. And this is the case of Connor against Chief Constable of the South Yorkshire Police. And in this case, the Employment Appeal Tribunal determined the correct approach to calculating holiday pay for a crude but untaken holiday on termination of employment. And here the claimant was dismissed following a long period of absence on grounds of ill health. He worked the same hours every week with salary paid monthly in instalments. His contract of employment provided that in respect of accrued but untaken holiday on termination of employment, payment will be based on one 365th of annual salary for each day's leave. 
Um, and basically this formula then resulted in the claimant receiving less pay for holidays due on termination of employment than he would have received had he taken holiday during his employment, which would have been a week's pay for each week of leave rather than five calendar days for a week's leave. So a subtle but important difference here, which, which can, and in this case did result in a different amount being arrived at. So the claimant raised a claim for unlawful deduction of wages um, and the right to paid holidays is set out in the Working Time Regulations 1998. Regulation 14.3 addresses payment for unused holiday for the year of termination and provides that pay in lieu can either be A, such sum as provided in a relevant agreement, such as an employment contract, or B, calculated in the same way, <clears throat> pardon me, or B, calculated in the same way as for leave taken, which basically would be under Regulation 14.3b, which has got a statutory formula for calculating the entitlement. So the tribunal looked at this and they held that the correct method of pay was that which applied in the relevant agreement, namely the contract of employment. Um, but the claimant then appealed against that decision and on appeal, the Employment Appeal Tribunal overturned the decision holding that a relevant agreement cannot result in an employee receiving less than the statutory amount due under Regulation 14.3b. So until now, this point had never really been settled and some employment contracts do provide for payment at a rate which is less than the statutory formula, particularly in what we often refer to as bad lever situations. Um, our advice here would be um, that it's prudent now for employers to check employment contracts and ensure that payment provides for the amount specified in Regulation 14.3b as a minimum for any statutory holiday entitlement. Um, so make sure you're not providing for less than um, what's provided for in the working time regulations, basically. Worth noting here, though, that this decision doesn't apply to any contractual entitlement above the statutory 28 annual leave um, days per annum. So that's the three cases um, which we wanted to mention today. In terms of key legislative changes, there's quite a few things in the pipeline, actually, most of which are due to go into effect next year. And details will be set out in the written Employment Law Lab, which will follow in the usual way. But just a couple of points worth flagging today. So some of you may have seen that the High Court has quashed the legislation introduced, which made it lawful for agency workers to be supplied to cover the duties of employees who were partaking in official industrial action. Um, so that legislation has been quashed, and while that could be appealed, we've not actually seen anything about an appeal yet. So I think just flagging this as one to watch if this is relevant to your organisation. And then also just to mention the Employment Relations Flexible Working Act 2023, which was passed last week. This makes some changes to the flexible working request regime. Um, so, for example, it will allow employees to make two requests a year, whereas currently they're only able to make one. And it will also shorten the time from three months to two for employers to consider the request. It doesn't actually, as was earlier suggested, make the right to request flexible working a day one right, although we understand the intention is that this will be introduced by secondary legislation at, at some point. And also it's not clear when the um, Act will um, come into effect, or, or, or rather when the changes in the Act will come into effect, but worth checking your relevant policies and processes now just to make sure that you're ready for this coming into force when it does. So that's all from me. If there's any questions, as I say, please do pop them in the chat and we can pick those up at the end. But for now, I will pass you over to Jen, who I can see has now joined us. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. And it's always lovely when you're doing a webinar in two minutes before you get an error message saying you've been asked to leave. <laughs> you've been asked to leave and not permitted to rejoin. So, um, I could have taken that as a sign and left completely, but I came back. Um, so thank you, Jamie, for um, picking up the baton and um, doing introductions. Um, as Jamie will have explained, Alaria and I are going to cover um, the top tips section on this law lab. Um, and we are focusing on investigations. Um, I think investigations is having a bit of a moment. Uh, generally, um, you don't have to um, 
go more than a couple of days without seeing something else coming up in the news about um, kind of re revelations of um, either historic or current um, allegations of issues in workplaces or kind of voluntary organisations where it may be sexual harassment, it may be bullying, toxic culture is a term that's being used very regularly. Um, and, and often what we're finding now is that the kind of stock phrase that's being used in the media reports about this is the employer or the organisation will say we are conducting an investigation or we take all these allegations seriously, we will be investigating. Or more common now is you see a terminology of we have appointed an independent um, investigator to look into these um, very serious and concerning allegations um, and you know ultimately a kind of I guess a promise that there will be a, a report back um, at a certain stage once that person has looked into it so it prompted us um, as a team to really kind of reflect on um, the way that investigations are used in terms of employment law um, and it's I think it's one of these sort of concepts that we're all familiar with. I mean, it, it's actually bread and butter when you think of what HR and employment lawyers uh, do day in, day out. It does involve a lot of investigations, um, but it's something that can be very um, heavily scrutinised at tribunal or elsewhere if it's challenged. Um, and there is actually quite a lot of complexity to um, handling investigations correctly and skills in terms of investigations and and you know we ask a lot of whether it's managers um, or HR professionals who are doing it I think so the purpose of this session is really just to take a moment to kind of reflect on the different types of investigations you might um, become involved in and um, the nuances of each of them and the kind of key uh, tricky tricky areas to be familiar with as is always the case when we're doing these sort of sessions on um just the hour long webinar this really high level um kind of headlines for you to think about um we are um going to be delivering a more comprehensive investigation master class session um and we've already had quite a lot of feedback from clients saying actually that's something we could really use because it's one of those things where you almost take it for granted um, that everyone's up to speed on it but it's a really great refresher and as I say it's developed over the, the last few years quite rapidly so with that backdrop um, I'm going to cover one to five and then I'm going to hand over to Alaria who's probably breathing a big sigh of relief now that she's not having to cover one to ten because my computer wasn't working um, so the purpose of the investigation, why are we investigating? This is absolutely the most crucial part of the process, question to be asking yourself because it informs everything else that comes afterwards. Um, so it's really, really crucial that at the start of any investigation, someone has addressed their mind to why are we investigating? And there could be a number of triggers or prompts for investigations within a workplace. Um, you know, I, I always think the most obvious one, the one that we all come across most regularly is where there's an investigation in relation to potential misconduct or disciplinary matters, um, which could then lead to a disciplinary hearing. Um, also grievance investigations so again that's bread and butter I think we're all pretty comfortable with the fact that that happens um, more and more we're seeing it where there's whistleblowing complaints coming in um, and you can see how that could potentially become more complex and um, we'll come on to look at this issue of confidentiality anonymous witnesses but if you do have one of those helplines or you have an anonymous whistleblower that could prompt an investigation um, there could be a regulatory reason um, why you are investigating. So you may be an organisation that's governed by a regulator or you may have individuals who perform regulated roles. Um, and so you may have an obligation there um, to investigate certain issues or, or allegations um, when, when they're raised. Um, and more generally now, I think 
you know, the, the prompt for an investigation can come from third parties, um, former employees, or where you start to see this general theme or trend coming through of either historic allegations or um, kind of high volume allegations of cultural systemic issues. So, for example, last week there was the McDonald's um, story in the news where I think it's more than 100 individuals are now saying they've all been subject to bullying and inappropriate conduct and so it sort of proliferates and that can prompt an organisation to say right it may not be an existing employee they may not want us to um, take individual action as such but we're sufficiently concerned that we're going to do a broader investigation. Um, so there as I say there are all these different ways where an investigation might be the correct course of action but you need to really reflect on why are we doing it what is the purpose of this um because that will then set all of the next sequence in motion and so number two is is who should investigate and Again, that might seem like a really obvious question. If you handle investigations, you know, um, within the people or HR team, it might just be whoever's got capacity or you might task a manager with an investigation. Um, but do think carefully about, you know, issues of employee relations. Is there Are they too close, for example? Could there be an overlap of allegations against a manager? Um, or um, I guess more, drastically should it be someone in your organization who is conducting the investigation or do you want to look um, outside and potentially have an external and in independent investigator and a theme that we are seeing and something that's being asked of us um, more regularly is for external um, lawyers to come in and actually conduct an investigation now that can be you know, that's a, a very different role for us to play than being your advisors in the context of a privileged conversation, a legally privileged conversation where you phone us to say, look, we've got this very heated um, grievance, counter grievance. There are these nasty allegations. We want your advice on uh, the legal risks and how to handle it. And in that situation, you'll all be familiar with us helping you review the documentation and potentially shape the strategy in terms of how you're going to handle it and our advice in that context wouldn't be disclosable we wouldn't be on the record so to speak for anyone else um, in terms of our input this role of independent investigator is very different to that that would be where an organization says we think we might have something that's either sufficiently serious um or um sufficiently um you know, broad in terms of the number of complaints or how deep it goes within the organisation that we want to hand this over to an independent investigator and we want a lawyer to do it because A, we want to demonstrate to our employees and to any other third parties we're taking it extremely seriously and B, we want to know the person we're handing it over to has that level of skill and understanding of the process in terms of an investigation. So, as I say, it, it's very important that you know why you're doing the investigation at the outset, because who you choose to be your investigator um, will, will be informed by that why question. What will also be informed by the why question is what it is that you're investigating, the scope of the investigation. And uh, as I say, we don't have time to get into the, a full level of, of detail on that today, but I often think that is something that um, needs more reflection at the outset of an investigation um, because if you just hand something over to someone and say um, can you deal with this investigation they may have a very different understanding of what the scope of their remit is and what they are being asked to look into um, as compared to what you had in mind um, and it may be that in some situations an investigation scope is restricted solely solely to fact gathering or evidence gathering with absolutely no findings being made. If an individual, an investigator doesn't know that they're being restricted to that scope at the outset, you could find that 
you know, a report is produced or findings are produced that then potentially prejudice or compromise any subsequent processes because that investigator has gone way beyond um, their scope or remit. Um, the scope can also really help in terms of knowing, um, you know, what allegations are we looking into here? Now, that might be factually, um, you know, recording these are the allegations, this type of conduct by this individual during this time frame. Um, and again, that really helps the investigator know, look, these are my parameters, this is what I need to do um, to be focused. Um, and it also means that there's no misunderstanding. And what you don't want is for someone to spend, you know, a great deal of time on an investigation only to find that we wanted them to look at something either more narrow or broader, and then they have to go back and re-interview individuals. Um, it may also be possible at that stage to outline who you think you're going to have to speak to witness wise um, and you know that will always be subject to, re to review or I think it should always be subject to review because as we all know these things can evolve um, but it, it, again it's just that focus right at the start for the investigator and for the organisation to know they're on the right track um, and they're not going to go too far beyond um, what you had intended. Tip number three is confidentiality and witness issues. This is something that comes up a lot. Um, now, I would say we see it most commonly in the context of investigations in relation to potential disciplinary issues and grievances. So you, I guess the two most common issues are you have someone that maybe um, alerts a manager or HR or the people team to something that they say has happened to them or that they have experienced and then they backtrack and say actually scrap that I don't want any action taken I don't want to be um, named as an individual who's the complainer or you might have someone who is a witness to alleged um, conduct that you're investigating and they say I am either not willing to participate um, at all or I'm only willing to participate if I can have a guarantee of anonymity. And I'm sure some of you will have encountered that kind of anonymous witness issue um, on a number of occasions. Dealing with the first scenario where you've got the complainer who says, I don't, I actually don't want to progress this. I don't want to be named. Um, that's very, very difficult um, because there's a question over how far you can progress an investigation if the person who's the complainer or the subject of the alleged um, treatment who is effectively not willing to participate. There are some situations I've had with employers, um, that being said, where what has been alleged is, is so serious um, and for them as an organisation goes right to the heart of the culture where they say, you know, we can't unknow what we now know <laughs> of what you've said. And so, um, albeit, you know, we cannot force you to participate, we now need to investigate to the extent that we think we can um, as a result of that information. And you'll all be familiar then with the, the balance of risk involved in that. It, it, you know, you could have an individual that says, I told you that in confidence. I then told you I didn't want it taken any further and you proceeding with it could expose me and I'm potentially subject to the risk of retaliation. That could be constructive dismissal. Um, these are such delicate, delicate, finely balanced issues that if you get into that sort of situation, I would really urge you to take a step back and um, weigh up the risks, take advice. Um, and as an organisation, it will ultimately turn on, you know, whether or not you feel you are able to say, OK, we're not going to take this any further because we recognise there's maybe a risk of constructive dismissal or whether you say, actually, you know, we will do everything we can to support you and um, to reassure you in terms of the processes we have in place, but we feel we need to take this forward as um, as a potential um, investigation because of the seriousness of it. On the witness issue, um, I think, you know, everyone needs to be clear when they are participating in these processes that the information that they're providing um, it, it may be used as part of a formal process. Um, I don't think it should ever come to a surprise as a surprise to someone if they 
um, are interviewed as part of an investigation um, that this may be seen by um, another colleague potentially who may be subject to an internal process. The, the need for confidentiality um, should be emphasised right at the outset um, for all individuals concerned. Um, I am never a fan of giving anyone the kind of anonymous witness status unless it really cannot be avoided. Um, you'll all be familiar with the kind of principles of natural justice. If we're assuming that this is something that might turn into a disciplinary issue um, against another individual, you can imagine just how frustrating and difficult it would be to defend yourself if you're being given a pack that contains um, statements from anonymous witnesses. There's also just the, the reality of the situation, which is that even if you put employee X at the top of a statement, there's the ability for people to, you know, put two and two together. Jigsaw identification is, is what it's often called. Um, and so you should never give a, a guarantee of anonymity um, to anyone who requests it because that's just not something that's in your gift. Um, but again, what you can do is explain that, you know, you have processes in place um, and that, you know, you will do what you can to support all individuals going through the process. Um, if you feel you have absolutely no option but to go down the anonymity route, um, then, you know, you just you need to go in with your eyes open that you will then potentially face challenge if someone is is subject to disciplinary allegations because they, they may say it's very difficult for me to defend myself. Um, historic complaints, again, a really tricky area um, with the Me Too movement in particular a few years ago. Um, we had a number of questions from clients saying people are coming forward about things that have happened a very long time ago in their view or in their recollection and um, sometimes involving employees that are no longer here what what do we do and um, and again you know there's uh, there's no kind of legislation on what an appropriate investigation is um there's there's no kind of i guess um right or wrong answer it, and that's why I say, you know, actually equipping your managers and equipping yourselves with the skills for this is so important. And it can't be assumed that a one size fits all um, approach is going to do the trick. Because actually in that situation, again, you're weighing up, right, OK, so is this a particular serious, particularly serious allegation that I'm being faced with? Or is this a low level grievance from 10 years ago that actually there's, you know, I don't think there's any merit and it's not proportionate in investigating it versus, you know, an allegation of institutional racism which has pervaded an organisation for years and still exists or sexual harassment, um, you may then as an organisation say, we're going to um, we're going to look into this as much as possible. You will have restrictions, um, you know, placed upon you in terms of how you can gather information. If you've got former employees, are you going to start going and asking them for information, even though, although they're no longer employed by you? You know, there's a question over how much you involve third parties outside your organisation. Um, there's also just the real difficulty of recollection of events, uh, you know, as time passes, you'll all be familiar with how different people's recollection of events can be from like last week when there was an altercation in the office. Never mind someone saying 10 years ago at the Christmas party, I say this happened. And someone else says, absolutely not. I don't know if any of you were following the Kevin Spacey um, trial and there, there was live reporting and there was like this whole section on did he or didn't he attend the tiara ball that Elton John and his husband throw every single year and I was thinking oh my god he's producing his calendar and he's getting his PA to confirm where he was in that year so you know there are real difficulties but again for me it's just this question of you know culturally is this something that you feel comfortable not doing anything about and if not and you feel you have to do something there's just a question of proportionality you cannot be expected to be the police or you know to invest 
you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds in investigating something where it's just not possible because the evidence isn't there. Um, but equally, you know, if you are promoting a culture of anti-discrimination being a great place to work where we, um, you know, are an employer of choice, then it may not sit well with you to just sort of take a step back and say, well, oh, that was from, you know, that was before my time. I wasn't even in the HR team then, so I don't, I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, there's maybe a middle ground um, with historic complaints. Um, really briefly for me before I hand over to Ilaria, interplay with criminal proceedings. Um, I do think that's something to be aware of and it's something that comes up um, very often I would say in the context of potentially kind of sexual harassment allegations. Um, there's no um, general prohibition on an employer conducting their own internal investigation um, where the matter is also as far as you understand it to be subject to police investigation. Um, it is possible for employers to continue with their investigation. Some employers take the view, we're not touching it. If there's a live police investigation, we're gonna suspend the individual on full pay pending the outcome of the criminal trial. Um, I think that's quite, um, I guess, a, a, a historic way of dealing with it, which is not particularly commercial, I have to say, because um, you may then, you're well, you're kind of at the mercy of how quickly the criminal justice system moves. And if you've said to someone, you're, you're on suspension on full pay, that could be, you know, a couple of years potentially in extreme cases. Um, so you may wish to proceed. Um, if the police tell you to down tools and not to investigate, I would take that quite seriously. Um, you know, you don't want to go against um, what the police are saying. You may want to take your own advice if that's something that you may want to challenge and, and you are very keen to conduct your own investigation. Um, but I would just say be beware of um, you know, what your own employees are saying about how much they are or are not willing to share with you where there's a criminal investigation. It's totally their prerogative whether they participate with the internal investigation. That being said, you as the employer are then entitled to make a determination based on the facts as you know them. Um, so you can't force someone to participate, but equally you can make a determination um, if you believe that's the right thing to do. Um, so very much dovetailing with that, Ilaria, um, your first one is regulatory obligations. Yeah, thanks, Jen. So um, in a similar vein, um, obviously you could come across an incident where there's criminal proceedings um, and if you're in a regulated sector, um, you may come across a situation um, where you've got regulatory obligations at play as well. So obviously in the first instance, employers who are regulated um, will always need to bear in mind the obligations that they have to their regulator. And the specific reporting requirements will obviously vary um, and be specific to each regulatory authority. So it's always going to be important to consult the relevant rules which apply. But generally speaking, it's prudent and in some cases uh, a requirement even um, to report um, or, or notify the relevant uh, regulatory authority about an investigation at a very early, early stage, um, usually before an investigation um, has even commenced. So employers usually have to flag these issues as soon as they become aware of them um, and before they've had the opportunity to gather all of the relevant facts. So one particular thing to watch out for is to make sure that that notification to the regulator is fair and accurate and keeps to the facts based on what is known at that stage. Because if your notification um, strays into culpability of that individual before you have done any proper investigation or made any findings on that, um, then the employee might be able to point to that um, at a later stage and, and say that any subsequent decisions that were taken in an internal process um, were prejudged. But once you've notified the, the regulator, um, an employer should to normally be able to press ahead with their own investigation. That is, of course, subject to what the regulator says, uh, similar to as um, Jen mentions in the scenario where the police might tell you to down tools, a regulator uh, may say similar and, and, and ask uh, for you to hold off investigating until they have had the chance to do so. But in most cases, you should be able to undertake your own investigation as well. 
And that's generally recommended because if you have conducted a thorough investigation internally and you can demonstrate that you've taken an objectively comprehensive approach to fact gathering and your learnings in that process, then that's only going to stand you in good stead from a regulatory point of view. So, for example, if there was a complaint made um, to the Information Commissioner, um, then any remedial action or sanctions which the Information Commissioner may be considering applying um, can be informed by the fact that as an employer um, or as a business, you've done a good job at addressing the issue yourself. It's also usually best practice to, to press ahead if you can because of the failure by the employer to investigate a matter promptly or at all um, could result in unfair or potentially even unlawful action against the individual. And so the employer could find themselves in the territory of facing wrongful dismissal or unfair dismissal or even discriminatory dismissal claims amongst, amongst others and um, potentially even whistleblowing as well. So, for example, if, if you were to proceed um, without any form of investigation, that, that's likely to, to um, result in an unfair dismissal claim um, if you dismissed on that occasion. Um, but equally, excessively delaying an investigation could result in constructive unfair dismissal claims if, if an individual um, resigns uh, due to, to excessive delays on the part of, of addressing the issues that they've raised. So, as noted as well, the regulator can also conduct a, a, or may also conduct an investigation in parallel uh, to, to um, the organisation. And those processes can become quite involved and be lengthy. So um, the FCA, for example, have uh, certain powers um, and they have um, a, a drawn out process which can involve multiple stages um, and they can that can involve compelling individuals to attend interviews um, you know threats of contempt of court and and they can just become uh, quite involved and time consuming and, and lengthy so if you are able to advance your own investigation and um, whilst that's ongoing it's it's usually um, helpful because obviously as an employer if it's relating to employees you'll have to manage the ongoing employee relations in the interim. But ultimately, of, of course, as, as mentioned, you'll need to consult with the regulator and make sure you follow their rules and guidance. So the key point really is if you are in a regulated industry, then be aware um, of this being an additional consideration before launching into your internal investigation. Um, for example, in the employment team, uh, we'll work closely with our colleagues who are familiar with regulatory regimes across the board. So whether that's health and safety, FCA uh, rules or information uh, commissioner complaints. And we'd always get them involved in an organisation uh, investigations um, if there's a, a blended approach that, that's required. So moving, moving on then to the standard of proof um, required in an investigation. Now, the degree of exhaustiveness which is required of an investigation will depend on its purpose. But in a disciplinary investigation, for example, um, there's no requirement for an investigator to leave no stone unturned meaning there's no need to explore every line of inquiry or cover every detail of the matter. But an employer must investigate sufficiently to ensure that the substance of the allegation is clear so that that uh, can be put to the employee in sufficient detail to allow them to provide a meaningful response. Because in a disciplinary um, scenario, a tribunal, if it, if it got to that stage, would have to determine whether an employer has carried out an investigation which was reasonable in all the circumstances, which is judged objectively by reference to what's known as the band of reasonable responses test. So the tribunal's not there to decide whether it would have investigated things differently, but just whether the investigation that was carried out was reasonable. So that's really the key word here is reasonable. Proportionality is a major factor that will come into that, and Jane has touched on that um, already. Um, if the severity severity of the allegations involved are, are so severe, um, then the investigation should be more rigorous, especially when the, the charges are particularly serious and could have a far reaching impact on the employee or those um, who are subject to it. So if, for example, it could result in the employee losing their job or potentially not even being able to work in that particular particular industry ever again. So per, perhaps, um, you know, if they are facing charges which could go before a regulator and mean that they're you know, struck off from ever performing that role again, then a more thorough investigation would be expected in those scenarios. 
But in addition to that, any investigation should be even handed and should look for evidence which supports the allegations, but also evidence which goes against them. So that could mean um, following up with aspects of a witness's evidence that might raise some unanswered questions. So probing that further just to see if there's any inconsistencies there or whether a recollection of events might co conflict with someone else's. But you're not just looking for evidence of wrongdoing, but also evidence that points towards the innocence of the alleged perpetrator, because the investigation must ultimately or should ultimately be free from any bias towards a particular party. It's also important just to bear in mind that it's not normally um, for an investigator to make findings in relation to culpability. Instead, the investigator should be seeking to establish the facts and so far as they can by reference to the available evidence, in addition to identifying what can't be established as well. So ideally, they should endeavour to reach conclusions about what did or didn't happen even when evidence is contested or contradictory. So whilst there's no requirement to find um, proof beyond all reasonable doubt, as is the case in a criminal court, an investigator will need to decide whether on the balance of probabilities, they could justifiably prefer one version of the matter over another and also explain why. So then moving on to the outcome and the next step. So once all the evidence has been gathered, the investigator will need to present their findings in a structured report, setting out what steps they've taken to investigate the matter, what facts, as we said, have been established, and potentially what recommendations they make where that is appropriate. Now, it's important when you're drafting a report to bear in mind who will be reading it. Obviously, they're likely to be read um, by the subject of the investigation potentially also the complainant, but could ultimately also have a wider audience if matters proceed to a tribunal, for example, or where they're picked up in the press, as have some of the recent headline grabbing um, articles that we've seen of late. Now, ACAS has shared some tips for report writing, which can apply um, on a wide basis to, to all types of report writing and um, to generally keep your report uh, writing in an objective style. Um, avoid nicknames and jargon and use the same form of address for all the people who are referenced. Also suggest using appropriate language and keeping things simple wherever possible by sticking to the facts of the matter, keeping it concise and including all the evidence that was collected. So then once a report has been completed, it will then be essential for the employer to carefully review the findings and take appropriate action. So not to simply ignore um, the report and, and take no action as a result, because um, that brings us on to our ninth point in respect of reputational issues. As um, we've said at the outset, there have been a number of high profile workplace investigations uh, in the news recently, which show the damage that can be done to a business's reputation if workplace matters get into the public domain. Now, investigations particularly involving sensitive allegations such as sexual harassment or you know, toxic cultures of bullying and discrimination are the ones that are likely to attract and have, as we have seen recently, attracted significant media attention. So from a business point of view, the way that it's presented by the media and reported in the press is often what leaves a lasting impression of the viewers um, of the news or the readers um, of that particular article and that's the impression that they have regardless of how good the investigation was or the outcome of it and that can have very serious knock-on impacts on things like customer or supplier relationships who may want to start uh, to disassociate themselves from the business if it's being broadcast that there's a, a toxic workplace culture. So it's really important for employers not to see things in isolation or to think um, that simply by deciding to dis uh, discipline someone that they can just close off that process and, and think that that's the end of it. If the allegations are particularly serious or sensitive in nature, then external communication should be a really important part of your action plan. Ideally, you should have someone in your communications team or someone at board level who's thinking about the reputational risk and how to mitigate that. 
and your approach to external communications, um, what that might be if you are approached by the press. So finally, just touching on litigation and disclosure requirements, because in the event that uh, an employee, for example, raises a tribunal claim, then there will be a requirement on both parties to participate in a process which is commonly known as disclosure. Now, there are some differences on how that process works in Scotland and in England, um, but in England, the disclosure rules require that each party must send to the other all documents they have which are relevant to the case at hand. And whilst the rules in Scotland are not quite as broad, it is worth bearing in mind the employee's right to make a data subject access request, um, which allows them, of course, to request uh, personal data that the employer holds about them. And they are very often now being used as a tactic in litigation for the employee to try and get their hands on information which might help their case. So I suppose our, our top tip in that regard is to draft emails or reports um, as if they are being read by a tribunal. If you wouldn't want your text to be read out in a tribunal setting, then don't write it down. Be our, our top tip, um, takeaway tip, uh, if you would agree, I Jen. was just going to say, Ilaria, <laughs> yeah, I'm just chuckling because a client said to me recently, someone got them a mug saying, dance. It's like no one is watching write emails like a tribunal is reading them so yeah. <laughs> that should be the real that should be the real great words of advice <laughs> yeah i know um so thank you Lara. you've kept time perfectly and i never do so i appreciate you um doing that um we I'm sure a number of you need to drop off just before we finish though I just wanted to say two things first of all for anyone who's popped questions in the chat group um, we'll follow up with you directly um, so we're not leaving you hanging but I know everyone's on a tight schedule but just on that final point about litigation and disclosure requirements um, there has been a recent case actually a uh, University of Dundee case um, where this question of um, it's a difficult question of whether a document is subject to legal privilege and their legal privilege and doesn't need to be disclosed as part of litigation um, has been has been challenged and aired and so what I would say to you is the key takeaway from that case is that if you want the benefit of something having the legal privilege badge and therefore not being capable of being disclosed, um, you need to speak to your lawyers, whether they're your in-house team or your external lawyers, before a draft is produced. Um, because ultimately in that case, what they said was an investigation report was produced, a first draft was produced by someone internally without any legal advice being taken. Um, there was then a subsequent conversation and a second draft was produced, after which time, you know, it was very difficult to then say, well, let's go back in time and apply legal privilege to the first draft. So I guess my key um, comment for you there or key tip for you is if you're dealing with something that you think is particularly risky, high stakes, highly sensitive from a business point of view and you want the ability um, to get some legally privileged advice on it before a draft is produced then get your lawyers either internally or externally involved as soon as possible because um, it's difficult to, to try and construct that argument retrospectively. So Thank you all for your attendance. We will follow up with the recording. Um, and if anyone wants any more information about any of the training, then please let us know. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, bye.